Hello, in this um, short video we're going to take a quick look at around my little miniature STM32F042 um, development board. I built this because I'm, I was in the process of uh, developing um, a USB device and um, I, was, I needed to prototype it um, and I was looking out for one of my favourite um, discovery boards. I really like the STM32 discovery boards that ST have done. But unfortunately there just wasn't one for the F402. They've recently released a Nucleo board, but I'm not a big fan of those. I prefer the discoveries. So instead I decided to just put together a quick dev board of my own. And I'll just give you a quick tour around here to, give you, uh, to show you the board um, and its various features. And if you visit my blog site, um, there's a full write-up of the build of this board with all the schematics, all the Gerbers, and you can build your own. And I've, I've even got some PCBs left over, so if you're quick enough, um, I'll, I can, I'll send you um, a PCB of your own if you want to build one of these yourself. Firstly, the board itself. This is a 50mm square board of the type that you can get uh, manufactured out in China. I use Elecro to do this. The board costs $9.90, which is ridiculously cheap, for um, 10 copies. Um, for that I decided to get the red solder mask because I think it, it stands out well, looks nice. Um, and they are, they are dual sided boards, so on the, on the top side of this board um, you've got the uh, footprint for the MCU itself. This is the TSOP, um, TSSOP uh, 20 pin version of the MCU. Um, with, and the one I'm using has got 32 kilobytes of RAM. Um, on, you can also see footprints around here for an external crystal and various other bits which I'll go through on the build board, as well as the, the headers that we'll need to communicate with this board. And on the, on the back um, I've got uh, a nice handy little uh, section of uh, tables where you can see the um, the import where, where the important peripherals are on the STM32 F0. So if you want to use the use R2, these are the pins where you'll find the um, you know the, the transmit and receive. If you want to use SPI SPI1 the pins there. I've also got the uh, various timers because the timers can output their signals to the GPI GPIO pins. They're in tables here. Um, I square C is there. Use R1 and more uh, more timers. Just, that's just a handy quick reference to save having to break out the reference manual every time you want to remember where the pins are. And here it is, all built up and ready to go. Now the, um, the process I used to actually build this was uh, basically about three stages. Um, I chose to reflow the larger parts using my reflow oven, my Android reflow oven that you can read about on my website. Um, I uh, tinned the pads, I placed the, the ICs on the pads, I did the ICs, the inductor, um, and uh, that's yeah, that's about it for the larger parts in the reflow oven. And I, I did that um, in uh, in that way because I, I didn't include the smaller parts in that stage because sometimes they have a habit of blowing away when you're not using solder paste to hold them down inside a reflow oven. They have a habit of uh, blowing off the little um, uh, tinned you know pads that I create for the reflow stage. So I just did the ICs in this stage. So the ICs went down no problem at all in the reflow oven. And then afterwards, I just used my hot air gun, my um, AU852A um, hot air gun, to just place these um, 0603s and around the board. It's really easy. You can just heat, point the gun, plonk the components. Um, with flux already pre-applied to the tin pads, you just put the component down and um, reflow them with the, with the hot air gun. And the final stage was to um, do the, the through-hole components, which obviously the pin out, the pin headers here, and the, um, the crystal. They, they went down with a, a normal iron. And after that, we're done. Um, the, just a quick mention of the uh, USB pin header. I did that one in the oven as well because that's that's a, a large surface mount um, device. Um, it's, it helps to do it in the oven because these uh, little pins that you can see down here um, are quite hard to reach, so it's easy to get best to get them down in, in the reflow oven. Now it may look like that that uh, surface mount um, connector is actually quite uh, going to be prone to being um, easily easily pushed off the board by you know insertion force of uh, repeatedly inserting and removing USB plug but in fact this um, footprint has got uh, two small holes here that you can see which um, on, on the plug there are two uh, corresponding plastic uh, like little um, pins that poke down into this to give the give the thing some uh, reinforcement against damage from um, you know, repeatedly reinserting the USB plug. So what have we got on here? Well, um, obviously we've got the, the MCU itself. You can see the TSOP20, TSOP20 package there. Um, that's a 065 millimeter um, IC. It's really quite easy to deal with if you're used to doing um, surface mount components. And obviously that's broken out completely here. All of the uh, GPIO um, available on it, which is not that many, are, are available. 
In addition to that, um, the USB, uh, uh, which are it's USB, which is on PA9 and PA10, if I remember correctly, um, go out to the uh, USB header here, which is also um, responsible for providing 5 volts in. That is a USB LC6 uh, anti-static um, IC there, so just, just to guard against damage from um, the USB cable being you know, repeatedly uh, put, pulled in and out. You could easily uh, damage the, the uh, MCU through static if you didn't have one of these in place here. You can see on my website the schematic for putting one of these in, and I do recommend that every USB design has one. Now, even though this is a small um, board, I decided I wanted to um, have a, a good power supply. One of the things that really really bugs me about some of the dev boards is that the, um, they can usually come with uh, either a very small uh, low dropout regulator to supply the power, or they come with um, a, bit, a big one, like one of the uh, 1117 um, these packages, which on the face of it appears you know, just, uh, capable of supporting 800 milliamps to a one amp. But you know, obviously, they just that kind of um, power delivery requires a lot of heat dissipation, and um, if you ever tried to get near to one amp on um, the SOT two two three package that they usually put on board, you probably found your board catches fire before you get anywhere near there. So, in this case, I've decided to include a switching regulator. So the regulator on here is a Texas Instruments um, step-down buck regulator here that drops 5 volts down to 3.3 volts at an extremely high efficiency rate. It's like 90 plus percent. So you can get close to the 1.5 amp um, output of this thing and you, you, the amount of heat um, it would dissipate would be hardly any. You'd, it's, it's far more efficient using a low dropout regulator. And this is an adjustable um, adjustable device. So there's a couple of extra external parts required compared to a non-adjustable one. You've got a couple of set resistors here, and you've got the inductor, and you've got the um, catch diode here, the the shot key. But with with all of in my in my choice of components here, then it's actually the limiting factor is actually the um, the diode here. It can only handle 500 milliamps of forward current as, as a maximum. So do check my website for the notes on which parts you have to make sure are up to scratch, up to the up to the highest current level um, before you start trying to um, you know, use the switching regulator up to its maximum. So that's the power. Um, I've also got the external crystal here, an 8 megahertz one. Now if you've, if you've been um, programming um, an STM32F0 for any length of time you'll know that it has an internal HSI as they call it, a high speed internal oscillator which is quite capable of, of um, being uh, multiplied up by the internal PLL to give a core clock, core clock speed of 48 megahertz. But so you don't generally need one of these to actually get a simple design running, but the external um, crystal is far more accurate. These external crystals are much more accurate than the one than the internal oscillator built into this. So if you do need an external, um, uh, ac you know, highly accurate crystal, then these, these are better than using the um, LSI. Um, Another option, which is available to you for an accurate internal crystal, is to use the HSI48, which is kind of unique to STs, MCUs that contain the USB peripheral. Now, the HSI48 is a high-speed high internal 48 megahertz clock, um, which is specifically designed to supply the USB peripheral, because peripheral, USB needs 48 megahertz. But what's special about it, about the ST's implementation of it, which is quite neat, is that um, they they know that the HSI HSI 48 isn't going to be particularly accurate out of the box, so there's a capability built into the um, firmware for continually trimming the HSI 48 to an accurate uh, level, based on the incoming start of frame packets that you get as a USB device sent to you from the from the host every one millisecond. And this is quite a neat way actually of um, of generating the clock and making sure that everything stays accurate. And on my website, you'll find, uh, on the right for this, you'll find the code necessary for both enabling the USB peripheral here, because it's the pins for the USB D plus and D minus are multiplexed with GPIO, and they have to be specifically set up for USB before you can do anything. And you'll also find the code necessary for um, clocking the MCU internally from the HSI 48 and trimming it from the um, in incoming start of frame packets that you get from USB. Okay, what else have we got around the edge? We've got the um, power in and out um, pins here. Um, another thing that bugged me about some dev boards is that you just don't get enough ground pins. You can't have enough ground pins. Just, just if you've got any empty space on your board, just put ground pins there for goodness sake, because you just can't have too many. I've got a block of four here, nicely in the middle, which is which is nice, uh, nicely enough. And another one over on the GPIO header. We've got five volts out, which comes straight from the USB line, and we've got um, three point three volts out, which comes from the regulator. 
Um, here we've got a selector for where VDDA, which is the reference voltage for the um, analog uh, A for the ADC on board the STM32, comes from. With this jumper in place where it is, um, then the uh, the VDDA supply comes directly from the um, switching regulator over here. But if you wanted to supply it externally, you can f you can take this jumper off and you can um, supply VDDA to uh, one of these pins here. It's documented on my website. And this big fat connector down here is the standard um, SWD um, debugging connector. So you can just connect a standard 20 pin um, SWD debugging cable from the um, ST, ST-Link V2 board directly to here. I really wish ST had, had made their own cable for this instead of just going for the standard 20 pins because nearly all of the pins are either ground or not connected. There's only two or three actually necessary for SWD so um, the, well, the fact is they didn't and there you go so we have to make do with the 20 pin connector to make it um, as compatible as possible with the cables that people have. The jumpers here are simply for selecting where, where you boot from. Um, just about all of us hackers are going to want to develop, want to uh, boot from Flash, and that's why and the jumper is set uh, that way for that. Um, but you can you can put the jumper onto the RAM side here to boot internally from the RAM. Basically, you're selecting the level that the boot zero pin takes by moving that jumper. Finally, the uh, one feature that you don't often find on DevBoard, it's something I put on because I use it quite often myself, is that I've just included a simple NPN transistor up here. And the reason, the way it's hooked up is that the um, the collector of the transmitter is on this pin here, the LD, which actually stands for load. So you apply your load to that pin. Um, that's kind of directly connected to the um, collector of the transmitter and the emitter goes to ground. The base of the, tra of the transistor is connected via a 1K resistor into the MCU. And the base is also pulled down via a 100K resistor to, to ground so that you don't get any spurious switching events. The idea is that if, if necessary, you can use one of the uh, pins of the MCU um, to drive a, a higher load than you can normally drive um, using uh, plain outputs from the MCU pins itself. Because the MCU pins are generally limited to driving loads that that's, don't require more than, say, 20 milliamps. It's roughly that, anyway. Um, otherwise, you, you could break the MCU itself. And, of course, there's a, all, on top of the single pin 20 milliamp limit, there's usually an overall limit for the whole MCU. Which is, which is usually um, less than the number of GPIO pins multiplied by 20. So what this NPN transistor allows you to do is say, say drive, um, let's say uh, an infrared LED, they typically require more than 20 milliamps to come on, or even a simple motor. Just, it's just something that I, I often find myself thinking, oh, I need to switch this thing on, but I, don't, I can't do it directly from the MCU. All oh, right, I'll, I'll pull out uh, an NPN from the, from the parts bin, stick it in a breadboard and do it that way. Um, I just wished I'd have one on board. It's just a nice little idea, I think, to have a little switch there to be able to drive higher loads without any external components. Anyway, that concludes the walk around. Um, I'm, it's very simple, a very simple board. I'm very happy with the results. I've been using it to debug a USB device and um, I'm quite happy with the results so far. I'm certainly happier with the board than I am with ST's USB sample code. It's god awful. But oh, I'll work on that and I'll get it into shape so it doesn't occupy two thirds of the MCU before you actually even have any code of your own written. But that's an aside. So anyway, please visit my website, have a look at the write-up, and maybe build one of your own. Um, if you've got any feedback, do feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. And it works. This is the classic blinky test. I've got the uh, onboard LED flashing here. I know, not very exciting, but um, what it is proving is that um, I've got the MCU programmed correctly. Um, the basic uh, you know, the board is working, GPIO is working, the Cystic timer that's providing the 1 hertz flashing is working, the internal clock is set up correctly. Um, it's, it's a lot of stuff that gets proved out to be working just through one little flashing LED. And here's the board doing the classic blink test using the um, onboard transistor to provide the, uh, the switching for the 1 hertz flashing LED that you see here. What we've got is uh, three, uh, 3 V3 going um, through this, pit, through this uh, wire here to here, um, through the 100 ohm resistor, into the um, LED, out of the LED, and then into the, um, the load pin here, which is um, connected on the board to the um, collector of the NPN transistor. 
And what we're doing in the MCU is simply switching the base of the transistor on and off at one hertz through the PA7 uh, GPIO pin here, which results in the transistor switching on and off and the LED flashing. This basically demonstrates the way that the board can be used to, um, the onboard tra uh, transistor on the board can be used to switch um, a load on and off without having to have any external transistor set up here, something which I've always wanted on a dev board.